Unlocking Your World of Creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. Mark introduces you to some of the world's leading creative talent from publishing, film, music, restaurants, medical research, and more. You'll discover how to tap into your most original thinking, how to organize your ideas, and most of all, how to make the connections and create the opportunities to launch your creative work. Unlocking your world of creativity. Welcome back, friends. I'm Mark Stenson. And if you've ever found like I do, saying the phrase, it is what it is, our guest today is going to take a little twist on that creatively and say, it is what you make of it. My guest is Justin McRoberts. Justin, so glad to have you. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me on. It's a great twist. And Justin, when we talk about the world of creativity, I often think the world meaning globally and cities all over the place. But you take another twist at this world and say, I've been an artist, pastor, a singer, songwriter, author. I even love that you add neighbor and father. You've got a well-rounded, call it orbit of creative influences, don't you? Yeah, I do. Mostly because I, I try to apply that terminology to more than just things that people make and sell. So norm, oftentimes when we talk about the arts or artistry or creativity, we tend to narrow things down to like you paint, you sing, you write, and then, you know, other people maybe make movies or whatever. But I think a more responsible, a more theologically robust, a more humanly honoring understanding of art and of creativity broadens that definition and it has more to do with the posture I'm in in relationship to the things that I do rather than the particular things that I do. How do I approach the things that I do? That's the thing that makes it artistry or makes it creativity. Because you and I both know there's some folks, <laughs> there's some people in the world who make things that are traditionally uh, called art from the market standpoint. It's not very artistic. It's market research and data analysis and creating of a, of a product for the sake of sales. Yes. And we'll call it art, but that's not really what it is. Uh -huh. So I want, I want to change the way we understand that a little bit. And it's interesting. You're also using it as a different sort of almost form of speech. Yeah. You know, that you're doing things creatively rather than I'm making something called creative. Yes. So Seth Godin, who's a deep influence in my life, suggests that art is anything I create that forges a, a connection between people. That is, I find to be the most enlightening, and like I said before, robust definition of what art is. Anything that I create that forges a connection between people, which is to say that some of the greatest art, the most pervasive art, some of the most important art is uh, mealtime or the forming of a household. These mundane things that, or these things we've, we've understood as mundane that actually hold life together. You know, I'd like for folks who read my book or listen to me on a podcast to go back into the lives they're living and think, if I didn't do what I did, if I wasn't vacuuming the house, if I wasn't making my space hospitable to people, the threads would start to fall apart on what it means to be a neighbor. Like I do things that forge connection between people. This is art. I want mm -hmm. That's how I want people to think about their own lives after eng engaging with my work. And you're really expressing this idea both, as you say, in your message and in your book, making something good from what you have Yes. rather than a accepting everything hey it is what it is but also just taking all these ingredients and saying well i'll, I'll only follow the rules i only yes. connect the dots the way they're meant to be connected yeah i mean there's a story from earlier on in the book in which uh my son uh and i had ordered a lego kit it came with like a couple bricks missing i think it was two bricks missing there were 74 required we only got 72 and my son was bummed i was bummed because we got to a place in the process it was very clear like we don't have all the pieces it's yeah. not going to look the way it does in the box and uh -huh. what we did in that moment for a moment is we got bummed which was important it was important to get sad uh and the way i write in the book is like if i don't give sadness its moment it will come steal that moment from somewhere else and so we allowed disappointment to have a moment. They're like, yeah, this is not going to look the way it does in the box. Mm -hmm. And then we got back to work and we grabbed older bricks and we assembled and disassembled and imagined and laughed and giggled. And by the time we were done with the thing, it wasn't the desert rally racer from Lego because that it didn't look like it did in the box. It was the McRoberts truckish spaceship thing. And it looked like us. It, it looked more, yeah, it looked like the father and son put it together, which was more important, especially in the moment. And I think that happens a lot. In fact, I think that happens most of the time. Plans fall apart. 
And I don't, when I say that, I don't mean some, all plans, literally every plan. You and I will never put together a plan that will execute or can be executed at 100%. It simply doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. What we will have is we'll have our best laid plans and then we will have the opportunity somewhere down the line to pick up the pieces or, or look at the gaps and decide what we're gonna do with the pieces of those gaps. And that's actually the difference. That's actually the difference between growing as a human, being an artist and being parts of machinery because mm -hmm. machines can put together Lego kits, human beings can look at gaps and pieces and imagine what might be possible. And elevating that from, you know, the Lego kit or any other art, but the, the subtitle of your book helps encapsulate this mindset, doesn't it? Creating yeah. something great from what you've been given. So again, let's extrapolate this from just the kit and the box to what we've been given in life. What yeah. are some of those lessons learned for you? Um, but, well, boy, I mean, you know, I, I've worked in, you know, religious spaces off and on for a long, long time. And if there is a season, you know, if there's a season at all in which religious leadership needs to figure out, <laughs> needs to make decisions about what we're going to do with what we've been given, you know, I don't know how many of your listeners are, are church going cats, but there are far fewer people who want to show up to the Sunday gathering than used to. Mm -hmm. And that was a trend that started about 40 years ago anyways you know, where fewer and fewer people want to show up at a Sunday thing where there's music and there's announcements and there's a person who teaches, usually a man. People got tired of it. People were tired of church gatherings before COVID came and took them yeah, away. That doesn't have anything to do with masks. <laughs> uh, and that doesn't have to do with masks. It just has to do with boredom and it has to do with a really heavy reliance on a very specific expression, cultural expression of, of <laughs> I'll just, I'll end it there. It, it has to do with boredom. It has to do with a very specific expression, cultural expression of something that's actually due to the human. So for religious people right now, right now, the way I'm pushing my pastoral leaders, like folks that I coach, folks who are like trying to pastor communities or start religious things is there isn't a model that's going to work. Like, don't go look for a model. Don't go look for a methodology, decide what's in your heart decide how you want to live and then ask people to go with you. And that's all that there is, which literally has to do with like, what do you have on hand? What are the things you're interested in? What are the things you care about and lead people in that direction? Like this is that big fat moment. It's one of the reasons I wanted to drop the book now. It's because I know a lot of women and men who are their pastors and their faith leaders, and they're scared to death about what happens in the next season because they know factually that they cannot rely on being able to put together a slick Sunday service and hope people show up. That's done. That's literally mm -hmm. over. That season has passed. It'll work for a lot of people who have big budgets, but for the vast majority of people who don't have big budgets like Hillsong and everyone else, like you better do something you love. You better do something that's in your guts to do. So let's get inventive and creative and actually create religious communities and religious co connections that make sense for human beings. Mm -hmm. And what do you think some of those cultural shifts were that created that gap? Like, I really don't want to go gather you know, and do what I've done. We want people. Again, we'll go back to Seth Godin. And this is why I wrote the book. It is what you make of it is because, you know, I, I'm like everyone else. Like, I, I can go to a, a, some big religious gathering and, and I like the songs. It's cool. Music's great. Lights are fantastic. So, you know, this, the teacher, she's fantastic. She murders the message. She's got these wonderful analogies. I'm deeply entertained. I can do that and I can enjoy that. And it lasts for about as long as maybe like a really good Marvel film lasts in terms of enjoyment. Like, great, that's cool. And there are some lessons learned and I'm mm -hmm. somewhat formed by By the it. time you get to the parking lot, they're beginning to fade. And I've got some critiques because mm -hmm. I've seen as many of those as I have the Marvel films and beyond, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. And it's not all just entertainment. There's good, wonderful quality stuff going on in there too. But what I'm designed for is, is something broader than that. What I'm, what I'm designed for is actual, actual communal relationships which is the thing that everyone says. And I think the dominant shift was, like I said, there was a bit of a boredom. We've been doing kind of the same thing in the United States specifically, but in the West with regards to religion, we've been kind of doing the same thing for about 150 years. Okay, well, I think we might be done with that because that's a long, that's a long run. <laughs> that is a long on, run. It's a long run for anything. Uh, so some of it's a matter of just cultural boredom and some of it's a matter of like just deep communal wisdom, people recognizing what do you really actually want? What do I actually want? So when you talk to folks now about what they're looking for religiously, I'm talking to folks all the time who mean it now, because we used to say stuff like this, but we mean it now. I don't really want 
to be around organized religion. And what they don't mean by that is like, I don't trust pastors. What they don't mean by that is like, I don't like bands. What they mean by that is, I don't wanna be part of machinery. I wanna be connected to people. For a season, we trusted the machinery to put us in a room with people. Great, and then we can hang out with those people. But we don't need that now because you and I can jump up right now. We could do it if we if we were rude to one another. We could do it while we're on the call. Is I could be on my phone connecting with people right now. I don't need the machinery to put me in a room with people. I've got this piece of machinery to put me in a room with people, so I can connect with folks, and I want to do that more deeply. So one cultural shift is like we've been doing the same thing for a long time, and every cultural artifact has a shelf life. The other part of it is like there's a deep wisdom in the divinely shaped souls of human beings that actually do know what we want. And what we want is relationship with other people. And thinking about your creative process then, Justin, you know, certainly you've got this strong message and this belief and this approach. Uh, you as a messenger, you know, you want to get it out. But look at all the mediums, you know, the media that you find to express that. Just going through your website, the books, the speaking, the coaching, the music, et cetera. Talk to me about those various expressions of your message. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll jump, jump right off where we were before. I'm, I'm an artist. So what, like people ask, like, what do you do? I, I'm an artist. So I could say like, I'm a podcaster. I've got a podcast. I'm an author. I write books. I, you know, I've been a pastor. I've, you know, I've, I've helped run churches. I've taught, I'm a retreat leader. I do these things, a musician. In all of them, I'm an artist. Going back to the definition, I'm just trying to forge relationships. I'm trying to create things that forge relationships with people. And I do that because I do love the particular works. Like I love writing, like, and I'm getting better at it. I love this book. It's a really, it's a really good book. I'm very proud of it. You should buy this. Yes. Um, I'm really happy with the book. I'm, I've, I've been in the past happy with music I've made. I'm really happy with the podcast. I'm happy with the artifacts, but as, as much as that's true, I also want to set the tone for folks who are bearing witness to my life that I'm doing the, all of these things because it takes the, the conversation we are just having, like, what's it look like to mm -hmm. pastor? What's it look like to, to lead religiously? What's it look like? Well, this is what it looks like. It looks like picking up the pieces in your own life. Like, what do I like doing? What do I love doing and doing that and offering that to people so that I'm being, it takes an artist to forge relationships between people. So that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to lead religiously, culturally by creating artifacts, by being an artist. So it's too small a thing. This would be a little bit controversial. It's too small a thing if we're banking on a long-term future of uh, like people's souls and development and relationship, it's too small a thing to simply be a pastor the way we've understood being a pastor. It's too small. Mm -hmm. And the reason it's too small is because there literally is an industry that churns out pastors and plugs them into places that have a particular shape and machinery. And that's cool. And it was, but you need to be an artist now. You need, you need to not, not be a piece of machinery. You need to be an artist now. You need to like find your own joys connect with your own people, do the stuff that's in you, like do this, do the thing that literally no one's ever thought of. And the reason no one's ever thought of it is because no one's ever lived in your neighborhood at your time with your neighbors and your particular skill set. You are uniquely postured to do something unique and beautiful and wonderful. That's art. So go be an artist, not a pastor. Call it a pastoral thing if that's helpful for the paperwork, but be an artist now. And that's why I do so many things because I'm trying to bear witness to that. I'm an artist. Yes. Well, as a creative, I'm also picking up that there are senders, you know, that people who send out in their medium, but you're, you're taking almost the receiver's point of view. Maybe the art is going to, maybe that's the music. Maybe it'll be the written word, what, whatever it is that might appeal to you, you want to connect with them through that medium. Absolutely. I mean, it's the thing that pe people say about writing songs or writing books is if you try to write, to, if you try to write for everybody, you'll miss everybody. Mm -hmm. But if you, but if you write specifically your story, if you're faithful to the thing, you know, people will pay attention because they'll resonate with your story. This is just the stuff that's in me. And I'm going to be faithful to what's in me and people continue to resonate. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's not going to surprise you that a lot of people have those creative inspirations inside them and feel blocked, feel, uh, you know, I'm not good enough. Nobody wants to hear or see what I do. Uh, what would you say to them listening right now? <laughs> Uh, we need you. No one knows your kids the way you do. Uh, no one knows your neighbors the way you do. No one knows the people in your life the way you do. You are quite literally uniquely fostered. So your expression, your gifts, your talents, your strengths, your oppor like the opportunities you have are quite literally unique. And if you don't play your part, no one else does. So we, we need you. And so take that as a challenge, but also take that as permission. 
one of the things, like, to some degree, I think people have that, like, oh, no one's going to like it thing. But the other side of the coin there is, like, <laughs> whether it's, you know, the arts industry or it's religious industry, part of how we make sales is we basically let people know that it's not their turn. It's not your turn. It's their turn. It, let the professionals do the job. Let the professional th this person, let the professional that person, let the professional this person, let the pros do the job. You just go do your thing, do some laundry, take care of your household stuff, all the mundane, boring stuff. What I want to do is I want to offer people permission that like, you know what, Th that guy gets to do that because he spent $80,000 to go to seminary and he's still trying to pay that off. You get to do th something that's unique to you and your life. Uh, and I want you to have permission to do that because you're needed. Mm -hmm. And where did that inspiration hit you, Justin? Somebody said we need you. Or may maybe every morning you need to hear it. I know as a I creative, need I, I need a spark plug every now and then to say, let's go. Yeah, I do need to hear it a lot. I mean, it starts, you know, the, the way the book starts off is I was in a speech class my freshman or sophomore year of high school and I got in trouble for talking, which is that's a high bar to clear is to be in trouble in speech class for talking. Yes, um, but I'm, 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 I'm that committed. I'm that committed to my art. That's right. Um, right. And Mr. Ross, who was teaching the class, called me up in front of the class, and he he grabbed this large inflated cactus, and he set it down next to me. And then he went and sat in my chair. This is the opening story from the book. He sat in my chair, and he said, "Okay, Mr. McRoberts, you like to entertain people. The floor is yours for five minutes." And I froze, just froze, because it's one thing. It's one thing to steal someone else's moment. It's a completely different thing to have to make something of your own. And so I sat there for two minutes saying nothing until the kid that I was joking with initially got upset, bored, anxious, and said, come on, man, just pretend like you're in the desert. It's just a cactus. And Mr. Ross looked at him and said, no, it's not. And then looked me square in the face and said, it is what you make of it. So then for the final like minute and a half, two minutes, it was... A rocket ship and it was a long lost friend it was an alien and it was what i make of it because what it was what i made of it because it wasn't a cactus it's a piece of plastic with nasty teacher breath in it that's i mean that memory got lodged in my head that like nothing is what it is and that i've had the encouragement of other people in my life who have come along and said i think you could be good at this i don't think you're good right now the first record label deal i got was from a record label executive who i was living with at the time uh, with a bunch of other single guys. He was like, we were just living in his house. He was my landlord. And he knew I was playing around with songs. And he said, hey, have you ever thought about playing music for a living? And I said, no. You think the songs are that good? And he literally said, no, the songs are bad, but I like you as a person. <laughs> and he invested in my growth and my development because he saw in me something he wanted to see go deeper and get, uh, yeah, he, he, he wanted to see me develop. So I had it, I had it, I was challenged in it by someone who said, this is in you. Put this on stage let's see what happens and then i had someone come alongside and say i'm going to get behind this because i see the same thing mm -hmm. so it started because uh, and this is usually the way it goes and again this is why i do everything publicly it takes someone else to say i see this thing in you and it's worth investing time and energy in right sometimes you get that external motivation don't you oh yeah but do you also have uh, justin do you also have uh, i'll say practices rituals techniques that you find help you when you might be in one of these stuck periods Sure. Regularity is the big one. So I like, I'm calling you from my little office space in my garage mm -hmm. and I wake up uh, somewhere usually between four 30 and five. And I am in my office chair, the way it works now. I just, I took a little break over the course of the summer to do some other things with my specifically with exercise, but I get up in the morning and by five or five 15, I'm in that chair over my left shoulder and I'm there for an hour and a half and I'm gonna focus on some sort of project. And I do that every day, regardless of whether I feel inspired, regardless of whether I think it's gonna sell, regardless of anything, I have set the time aside. So the, like, I can talk about all kinds of like hyper-specific disciplines and practices and talk about note-taking. I can talk about archiving things and capturing. All those things are great. But the thing that holds it all together is regularity, is creating regular spaces, say, this is in me. This is who I am. And because it's who I am, I'm going to make room for it. I love that. Well, and you also talk about the period that we're in, the season, but I can't help but notice a sticker behind you. It says create anyway. <laughs> I'm not good yes. enough. I'm not smart enough. Or I don't have all the pieces, all the planets have. Yeah, but you don't, you don't do it because of that. You do it because it's who you are. And that's the thing. You, you do it because it's who you are. 
that's that's the that's the actual ball game is is like so many other things about human life i mean this is why this is one of the reasons i really love the judaic christian tradition in scripture is because it's almost always almost always a matter of forgetting this is who you are and then you forget and then there's some sort of a crisis and then we get reminded mm. and then we remember for a while and then we forget and then there's some sort of a crisis and then we're reminded we create in the world because it's who we are one of the reasons i keep saying it is what you make it is because literally nothing in the world is what it is everything in the world is a matter of agency a matter of choice a matter of power and a matter of will literally everything and that is because that's who we are as human beings the the dominant way we are we are godlike in the biblical sense to look like god is that we simply don't settle for it is what it is we don't settle for homes that look like this and water that lives no no, no. we build aqueducts and apartment complexes and we build aircraft and then we build better aircraft and then we build cars and then we build better and then better cars and and then we decide we want to like figure out what it feels like to touch that big glowing thing in the freaking sky and so we build a rocket ship like <laughs> it's not we don't create just because it's necessary that's there are times when we make things and they are necessary having shelter having food but at the core of it that's who we are it, it's it, it's what makes us look like god it's what makes us feel closest to god it's what makes us feel closest to one another we do it because it's who we are so yeah the circumstances will scream don't the industry around you will scream you don't deserve it or you haven't lived up to it your mom might be really frustrated because she wanted you to get a real, like, real simple, easy day job uh, <laughs> that makes really easy money. Uh, but that's it's not, not. It's not happening, mom. That's not, mom. And, I, and and part of my responsibility, if I'm going to love you well, mom, is I'm going to disappoint you, and then I'm going to prove you wrong because I'm better than you imagined I was. And so, like, it's in you. Like, we create because it's who we are, uh, and everything else comes second. Terrific. Justin, I've enjoyed our conversation so much. I can't help but wonder as you look over the horizon, what's coming next for you? And how do you see things around the corner? Sure. So I'll spend the next 18 months or so on the road with this one-man show I'm doing. It is what you make of it. Doing it off and on different parts of the country. I'm headed to Tennessee soon. I'm going to Oregon. I'll be in Ohio. Then I'll be in Virginia. I'll be all over the country for the next 18, 18 months doing this. Um, I drop a podcast once a week on Wednesdays or Thursdays. So I'll be doing that. I've got, I'm writing another book. I'm just going to keep making stuff, man. And we would expect nothing less. Expect nothing less. You've been listening to my guest, Justin McRoberts, and his website is justinmcroberts.com. So be sure to go by and check out all the resources, all the books, all the music. It's all there. And Justin, thanks for sharing all that with us. My pleasure. I guess we've all seen the sort of multiple influences that can bring about the work that we want to create. And Justin's the artist, the singer, and the songwriter, and the author of this great book, It Is What You Make of It. And as I mentioned, the subtitle is terrific, Creating Something Great from What You've Been Given. Thanks for the inspiration, Justin. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. And listeners, come back again for the next episode. We'll continue our around the world travels to talk to creative practitioners and artists of all kinds about how they get inspired how they organize their work, and finally, how they get the confidence and the connections to launch their work out into the world. And that's what it's all about. So until next time, I'm Mark Stenson, and we've been Unlocking Your World of Creativity. Take care. Unlocking Your World of Creativity with best-selling author and brand innovator, Mark Stinson. This program was produced by BSB Media, creators of IntelliKey Leadership Stories, Unlocking Your World of Creativity, and thepeaceroom.love. We've created a special offer just for listeners of the podcast. You can get the book, A World of Creativity, for a special price of $5.98 for paperback. And the Kindle version is only 99 cents. Go to mark-stinson.com to take advantage of this special offer. Our podcast is supported by Adobe and the Adobe Creative Cloud, the world's best creative app and services. So you can make almost anything you can imagine wherever you're inspired. We use Adobe to help make this podcast using Audition, Premiere Rush, InDesign, and more. So join the creative community with the Adobe Creative Cloud, and let's make something better, unlocking your world of creativity.